technology sometimes can be a challenge. But as we get started, I invite you into this, um, this greeting, which comes from uh, our, our scripture this morning. Uh, Hebrews is filled with a lot of quotable quotes. I'm not saying the whole Bible is not quotable, but some verses just capture you. They just catch your heart. And this is one of those that I've often thought of. And it comes from Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace. And think about that for a moment. A throne not of justice, not a throne of power, not a throne of glory, but a throne of grace with boldness. You know, the other thing about a throne is it's supposed to be something that makes those who approach it um, know the power of the one who sits on the throne. Like, the throne displays the wealth and the power. But to approach the throne of grace with boldness from us. Like, we would be bold before God. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This means, friends, that our, our confidence, as I'm going to share later in the sermon, is not based on how good we are or how much we have to offer the one who's on the throne, but that we might approach the throne of grace, that is, we go to receive that, with boldness because we want to receive mercy. Mercy means we've done something wrong. So friends, this week, this day, we don't come before the God because of how good you've been or how, what you can do or what you might do, but because we need help, because we need this opportunity to praise our creator. Because we need to spend this time reorient, reorienting ourselves to the reality of the gospel of Christ. To know whose we are and who holds us in his hands. That we know he loves you. And that we can be, receive mercy for our sins, forgiveness, and grace today. Please rise for the response of reading. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God. And a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The sea is his, for he made it. And the dry land, which his hands have formed. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For his is our God. And we are all the peat pester and the sheep of his hand. Amen, friends. Let us continue as we sing, as we worship this morning, as we sing number 706, our call to worship. Soon and very soon. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we are going to see the King. Let us remain standing as we invite our children, young and young at heart down, as we sing Jesus Loves Me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. 
Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. You may be seated. All right, that everybody? Okay. Okay, this past week something happened. It's not a really big deal, but we had a change of season. So what season is it? Winter. Summer. Who said winter? Okay. <laughs> it is summer. Do you like summer? Everybody likes summer? You do? What does summer mean? It's going to get hot. Yeah, it's going to get hot. It actually, it already is. So it's really hot. So, but let me, here's what summer means to me, though. So first, you're cold. <laughs> you're the only one. So summer means baseball. Summer also means hot dogs, right? Summer also means anybody want to guess what that is? Pie. Apple pie. Amen. Baseball, hot dogs, and apple pie. And for me, summer means one other thing. And that is vacation. So who all who has been on a vacation already? You guys? And you gone on vacation? Okay. So I really like vacations, and this is where I go on vacation. Everybody know where that is? Colorado. You betcha. And I like going to Colorado. Now, <clears throat> vacation is a time to rest and renew our strength, right? Or vacations can also be a time to really spend time with family and do a lot of fun things. But I like vacation <clears throat> because it's time to rest and renew strength. Did you guys know Jesus took the disciples on vacation? Anybody know that? You did? Okay. Are you just saying that? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they were going around and they were doing all that teaching and preaching and healing and sometimes they didn't have time to even eat. And they were getting really tired. So one time Jesus saw them, or saw that they were all tired. And he said, okay, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves on a boat to a solitary place. Okay? So, they worked so hard, they didn't even have time to stop, eat, and drink. So they were tired and Jesus noticed that. So when you go on vacation, notice what he said. He said, come with me. So remember to take Jesus with you on vacation, okay? Always talk to him and still keep your prayer life going, all right? Okay, here we go. We're going to say a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for vacation time. And thank you for being with us wherever we are. Amen. Amen. Amen, friends. Amen. As we continue in worship, I would, uh, I would commend to you these words from John Wesley. I'm telling you, friends, we believe that it is good news from God. What Jesus has is good news. Amen. Say hallelujah. Now, John Wesley, in his words, Directions for Singing, written in 1761 on page 7, that is the previous, the, with Roman numerals, it, the very early part of your hymnal, he says, see, it, number 4, he is, says this, Sing lustily and with good courage. Beware of singing as if you were half dead or half asleep, but lift up your voice with strength. Be no more afraid of your voice now, no more ashamed of it being heard than when you sung the songs of Satan. Here's my word to you, friends. We live in a culture in Kansas that's pretty reserved. We live in a culture that's pretty, pretty conservative, and that's okay. 
But I'll tell you what, when we are in the house of God and the only audience we need to worry about is Jesus, there is no reason for friends that for us not to be exuberant with our worship. I'm not here judging you, but I'm telling you this. Let us lift up our hearts before the Lord, truly giving him all of, our, all, of, all of us. Because when we do, friends, it will unlock parts of our worship I think we haven't seen in a long time. And bring joy to our worship. Doesn't matter the kind of music. Doesn't matter the words even. I'm not saying they don't matter at all. But I'm saying through all these things, God will give us the rewards of his presence. So let's stand as we sing our next hymn. It's number 3545, forgive me, The Church's One Foundation. Let's sing. The church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. With his own blood he bought her and for her life he died. Elect from every nation, yet one for all the earth. Her charter of salvation, one Lord, one faith, one birth. One holy name she blesses, partakes one holy food. And to one hope she presses, with every grace endued. Though with a scornful wonder we see her sorrow pressed, by schisms rent asunder, by heresies distressed. Yet saints their watch are keeping, their cry goes up, how long? And soon the night of weeping shall be the morn of song. Mid toil and tribulation, and tumult of her war, she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Will happy actions glorious, her longing eyes are blessed, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Yet she on earth hath union with God the three in one, the mystic sweet communion with those whose rest is one. O oh, happy ones and holy, Lord, give us grace that we, like them the meek and lowly, on high shall dwell with thee. Amen. You may be seated. I believe the... Uh, the words for that are written by Samuel Stone, but the music is written by Samuel Wesley, who I believe is the nephew of John Wesley. So, I don't know. Sorry, I'm filled with Methodist facts that no one else wants to know. Um, anyway, as we come before the Lord with prayer focus, our prayer focus this week, I'm asking and requesting that you as the church pray for church planters to see fruitful ministry and growth. One beautiful part about church planting is that every single church has had church planters, otherwise how it exists. Um, and the hope is that churches are planted not out of schism, as we just sang about, but out of the body of Christ desiring to multiply the worshiping community. And so, friends, there are still many churches being planted. In the, in the Global Methodist Church, there's an initiative to plant, I think, a thousand churches. Uh, we have new church plants all over. Pratt, um, Kansas, has a new church plant uh, near, near us, but there's others throughout our annual conference and actually throughout not just the United States, but, friends, we have over 4,600 churches in the Global Methodist Church right now, and many of them really are church plants. Um, not just because of the churches that have come out of other worshiping communities, but there are new initiatives. Up in Kansas City, there's a new, a brand new church plant that doesn't come from one church or anything, but 
It is um, just gathering those worshiping. And so um, it's a beautiful thing. Let's, let us lift up church planters, not just in Methodism, but in all of Christendom, that God may give them not only the supply they need for the work to do, but also the energy and, the, and to see some fruit. Um, under praise and request, I'm going to try to keep this one um, as uh, abbreviated as possible. Kip Young is the son of Elizabeth Winger Young and Wes Young. Wes and Elizabeth were the pastors in Argonia and Harper when I first moved here six years ago. About a year later, they moved out to western Kansas, and now she is the pastor of the Lakin Methodist Church, and he is the pastor, is it Satanta? Hugoton, forgive me. She used to be in Satanta, that's right. She moved to Lakin last year. Anyway, um, they're the pastor of the Global Methodist Churches out there, um, and she is the presiding elder for southwest Kansas. Elizabeth and Wes have a son who's around Tobin's age, and they were up camping in wilderness camping in Minnesota, backpacking in and out. And there was a, on Tuesday night, there was a bad storm, and a tree fell on their tent. And uh, they thought they'd lost Kit immediately. He went limp. Turns out within an hour, they realized he's alive, and they started trying to get cell service. And um, after some searching, they were finally able to call 911. Search and rescue got there an hour and a half later. So it took a few hours to actually start getting him out. They took him out on a canoe, okay? It was 12 hours bef- by the time they actually got him on an ambulance, get him to a hospital, and then transfer him to Children's Mercy in Duluth. And um, he is stabilized. He's actually, I just read an update during the children's time um, that she just posted that said that he's eating and he's awake and um, he's very stable. They're thinking about leaving in the next couple days to come home. But he has a skull fracture from the base of his skull up to the crown and had brain bleeding and everything. And he was double visioned. He couldn't walk very well and he's just really healing. Um, He's tired easily, but he's, God is healing. But friends, if you'd pray for the West family, the West, or for me, the Young family, and um, for, for Kip, that'd be appreciated. Tom Simons is the son of Doris Simons, who's been recovering from, a, uh, from low blood sugar and, and had an accident with his combine. He's fine, but he's home, but continue to pray for his healing. Pat Dixon had knee replacement surgery and is continuing to heal. She's just not up and running quite yet, but Lance said that she's continuing to heal, and we're praying for you, Pat. Uh, for Kathleen, Kathleen sorry, Taylor Ulalde is the daughter of Pat and Mary Lou Taylor. And um, her surgery is going to be on the 26th, so that's coming up this week. So we've been praying for her for a few weeks. She has an aneurysm, so they're going to be working on that. Um, those are the prayer requests that I have to share. And if you have any requests, please, please don't be afraid to use my number here um, at the church or on my cell phone to reach out to me. I'll give you a moment for your personal reflection, your private confession, and then I'll lead us as we go to the Lord. Let's go to God. Lord, you are good to your children. Lord, you love us and you wish that none would suffer, none would be lost of your sheep. But Lord, yet we still see a world broken and in need. Lord, we pray for those who are growing your church. We pray for those those church planters, Lord. Whatever name may be a part of their denomination, Lord, we lift up every church that is under the name of Jesus Christ. And pray, Lord, for your encouragement for them, for your spreading of the gospel through them, for the reaching those who are not yet knowing the good news of Jesus Christ, that they might grasp the width, the depth, the height, the fullness of the love of God, Lord. May they know your goodness, Jesus. May you empower them and encourage them to see fruit of their ministry, even in these early times. Lord, we pray for Kip and his healing, Lord, we praise you for the healing he has. But put your hand upon his head and that's fracture and bring him back to full health, Lord. We pray for Tom as he continues to heal. Would you help manage his blood sugar, Lord? May he heal quickly. We pray for Pat and ask that you would lessen the pain and the swelling, Lord, and help her knee to heal. We pray for Kathleen and her surgery this week. Would you 
Work through that, Lord, to bring about her healing. Encourage her in this day. Lord, we lift up these daughters and sons of yours. Lord, we also lift up our church. May we be one who shares the good news of Jesus Christ. May we approach you with boldness today, not to claim what is ours, but Lord, to ask and yield and request forgiveness and grace and mercy, Lord, as you have promised. For we are your sheep, the people of your pastor. Lord, we lift this as our prayer to you, the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, we have a king, which means we have a kingdom, which means that we love the kingdom our Lord gives us. So let us continue as we worship this morning. Let us sing, I love thy kingdom, Lord. It's a short little song um, with just two lines to the stanzas. Let's stand as we sing it, number 540. I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode, the church our blessed Redeemer saved with his own precious blood. I love thy church, O God, her walls before thee stand. Dear as the apple of thy eye and graven on thy hand. For her my tears shall fall, for my prayers ascend. To her my cares and toils be given, till toils and cares shall end. Beyond my highest joy, I prize her heavenly ways. Her sweet communion, solemn vows, her hymns of love and praise. Sure as thy truth shall last, to Zion shall be given the brightest glories earth can yield and the brighter bliss of heaven. If you remain standing as Lance comes forward to read from Hebrews. Today's scripture is Hebrews chapter 4 verses 12 through 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And this is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. The, um, the plan was to preach over Hebrews 5 this week. Well, my plans and God's plans were not the same plans. Um, because I started looking at chapter 5, and you know, the way the books were written was there were no... <laughs> the writer of Hebrews did not go now chapter 5, you know. They just wrote the letter. And so chapter 4 had some verses that I hadn't covered last week. 
that address this high priest that is really addressed as well in chapter 5. Surprise, surprise. And so I was like, well, I'll do a few verses out of chapter 4, and then I'll do the scripture from chapter 5. And then I started writing over chapter 4, and then I realized I hadn't even got to chapter 5 and I'd already written the sermon. So instead of giving you two sermons crammed into one, I'll preach chapter 5 next week, and um, here we are. We're on the last last half of the chapter 4. Friends, um, let's see what the Lord has to say. Dear God, we give you thanks for your word and for this time. This is your appointed time. Lord, it isn't the magic of an hour. It isn't magic at all, but Lord, it is your word opened and your truth displayed and your spirit's power. Lord, we're hungry. We need you, Jesus. We need your goodness. We need your good news. We need good news in a dark world. And Lord, we need to be held in your hands, both as your child, but also held in accountability, Lord, that we might grow, we might be changed, that we might be blessed to be more like you, so that the words of our mouths and meditations of our hearts may be found acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. How many of you have seen the first Dark Knight, the Batman the Dark Knight movie? It came out in 2012. Golly, I'm getting old. Um, 12 years ago, how many of you saw The Dark Knight? Really? Like three of you? Five of you? Okay. Your assignment is, no, okay. Um, it is one of my favorite movies. It really, I mean, it's not like up there, up there, but it is just, with superhero movies, they've been making all the Marvel movies for the past decade. They cannot touch Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight. That's my opinion. You're welcome to disagree and be wrong, but that's up to you. But uh, no, I just, I genuinely think this is better than anything that Marvel's put out. And that's saying something because I like a lot of those movies too. I really do. But just in The Dark Knight, we find Commissioner Gordon telling his son the following answer as to why Batman is running away. It's the very last scene of the movie. It's so dramatic. And so I'm not going to ruin the movie for you. Batman does live. There's a trilogy. You must know that. But um, he says this. And here's the quote if you put it on the screen. Because he's the hero... Batman is running because he's the hero Gotham deserves, but not the one it needs right now. So we'll hunt him. Because he can take it. Because he's not our hero. He's a silent guardian, a watchful protector, a dark knight. Like I said, this is one of my favorite superhero movie, movies. It, it, that moment... This moment ends an amazing movie that depicts a version of Batman we had not really seen before. Yes, we'd seen a lot of different characters play Batman at this point, but, you know, we are far away um, from the campy superhero in the original TV movie, the one that had Pal, (laughs) you know, in it. And it's it's this darkness, mysterious, a rough Batman. He wasn't the hero that Gotham wanted him to be. But he instead was no hero at all, but their protector and guardian. He isn't the one they want, but the one they need. And this is where Hebrews finds us with Jesus. Follow me here. He isn't the high priest they wanted, or frankly, probably even we think we want. But he is the high priest we need. The analogy fits. Don't overthink it. All right. (laughs) But he is the high priest that we need, not necessarily the one we were wanting. Let, let, it, let me explain. The high priest, if you remember, was one of three offices of the Old Testament. Uh, it brings, the, pre, the priest brings the people of God to God in worship. Re, he is responsible for bringing sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins, overseeing the worship of the temple and of the community. Once sinless by their own cleansing, that is, by going before God and being cleansed and forgiven, they would, on the Holy of Holies, one day a year, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, offer sacrifice for all of Israel. They take the blood of the lamb, of the sacrifice, and take it into the Holy of Holies with them, as per God's instructions. It was an office, one of these three three original offices. This office was held by the Levites, by the tribe of Levi, in the line of Aaron, the original high priest. The high priest of the temple in Jesus' time 
was nothing like that which God commands in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we get this picture of, a, of an upright, honorable, pure heart, you know, you hope pure from God, um, man leading Israel. But instead, this high priest was consumed with keeping his own power. In fact, the whole temple cult would have been consumed with this, with keeping peace with Rome and still trying to keep the power over the people of Israel. They were caught in between, as people were. And you see, Jesus posed a threat to Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. Jesus swore that he would tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. And that was not a friendly offer. <laughs> but that was an assault for them because the temple was the center of their government. Well, the king's palace would be the center of the government, but you get my idea here. Like, the temple held the Holy of Holies, which is the God. So that was where your judicial power was. It came from God. It was where your worship was from God. It was the center of your community because the power people were there in the court of the temple. That, everything centered around the temple. So to tear down the temple was to tear down everything. So he challenged their authority, Jesus did. And the high priest and the temple guard were res highly responsible for harassing Jesus. And honestly, they were the ones that found him in the garden, in the olive garden, where Jesus was, he was praying. And then they took him from Gethsemane to first be, try him with them and then to Pilate. They were very much a part of his execution. For the Jews then, the high priest and his function was very important. Hebrews is a book written to God's peoples who are the Jews. So it makes sense that they approach this topic and address it in the context of Christ. The purpose of this book of Hebrews is to prove that Jesus is the fulfillment of God's purpose and promise, especially the messianic promise. This is all about Jesus. And so first we have to start by knowing what was expected or desired of a high priest for the Jews. They would have wanted someone with a deep knowledge of the Jewish law, tradition, and scripture. They would have wanted someone with, to help guide the community spiritually to settle disputes and questions. And issues arising not only in faith, but in the community of Jews. Remember that for them, the faith the family, the justice, and more were all wrapped up. Their identity as Jews was all wrapped up in being God's people. You know, in America, we think of church and state as, for them, it's all just there, okay? I'm not trying to get into political debate. I'm just telling you it's a different worldview and a different setting and a different culture. So to see that, to glimpse it, might help us understand it better. Excuse me. They needed someone who was upright and moral to lead them as they went to sacrifice, which is highly ironic then that Caiaphas was as crooked as he was. They needed someone with political acumen. Again, you had the Romans who were pretty much their um, suzerain. That would be their, their, their overlords, their, the people really in charge. And then you had whatever puppets they put in charge or allowed to be in charge. And then you had the Jewish people underneath that. So those caught in the middle, Pilate, uh, King Herod, the high priest, Caiaphas, all of them and more were the political figures trying to figure out how to keep themselves in power, how to not let someone else take their power, but also how to let, make sure the people underneath them and above them were kept where they needed to be. And so this tension eventually broke. Because you see, in most of the Roman Empire, when, you, when Rome came and destroyed you, they tore down your temples and they built their own temples. The Roman gods, the Roman pantheon. But you see, what happened was, and I didn't look up the year, but in centuries past, the Jews had gone to help the Romans in one of their battles. And because of that, Caesar, to award them, allowed them to keep their faith and their temple. And so the Jews actually had this kind of exception to the rule in the Roman Empire. That tension, though, broke. And eventually, in 70 AD, that'd be about 40 years after the time of Christ, um, there was a revolt by the Jews, and Rome came in, not only put that down, but they tore down the temple, which is why, to this day, there is no temple in Jerusalem. The, the, centuries later, about 700 years later, I think, when the Muslims took it over, they built the temple, of the, um, the Dome of the Rock, there. But on the Temple Mount, in fact, the support for the, for the Dome of the Rock church, not church, for me, mosque, 
that stands there at this day sits on a foundation of, of columns that even Solomon built. Isn't that crazy? But if you go, if you put up the picture, there is still to this day the rocks that the Romans tore down in 70 AD. Isn't that crazy? It has been 2,000 years almost, and those rocks came from the temple that not Solomon built, but the second temple. And they are still there to this day. Someday I want to go visit them. I've not been there, but they... But I've been told those are the rocks from that temple that was torn down in 70 AD. The high priest at the time of Christ, though, was Caiaphas. He was controversial in that he was corrupt and willing to collaborate with the Romans. And that is why he takes Jesus to the Romans, to Pilate, to be executed. He knew himself that the law forbid him from executing Jesus. He, Jesus had not committed a crime, especially one that Caiaphas could prove. Jesus didn't commit any crime at all, but Caiaphas couldn't even trump up a charge. <laughs> So he takes him to Pilate to have Pilate do the dirty work, which eventually Pilate does just to get on. And so the high priest was a central position of power and authority in Judaism. It served not only a religious function, but a judicial one and a thoroughly political one. I argue then this. Jesus is not the high priest the people wanted in that day. You see, they sought out the death of Jesus, even when they could have chosen to release him. They wanted a political savior. They wanted someone to relieve them of the power of Rome, to overthrow the Roman Empire, at least get Rome out of their way, so that they could, again, reclaim that, uh, that position they had under David and Solomon when they were such a great and mighty nation. They did not understand the vision of God's kingdom that Jesus shared. They did not understand his sacrifice on their behalf. They didn't understand why he came, which is why they killed him. Jesus is the high priest, though. They needed, and we need. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, read this. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus Christ the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is enabled to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are without sin, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is the high priest who has passed through the heavens. Anybody else read that and just go... Huh, sounds nice. Keep moving on with your thoughts. <laughs> There's so much in this verse. It, this is one that I not really ever thought about. But we have to go back to the temple and imagine what it's like for the priest, the high priest, to go into the Holy of Holies. Have you ever heard of the heavens as described as a bit of a veil? You know, they're veiled from us, especially when they're cloudy. The high priest, in order to go to the Holy of Holies, would pass by a heavy veil. This veil on the night that Jesus died was ripped. The curtain was torn. It was a heavy veil, from what I understand. Don't think of a gauzy veil. Don't think like this stuff, hanging on the cross. But think of like animal skins. Heavy. Because this is the thing that, that partitioned off the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. And this veil would be what they passed through to go into the presence of God. We have a high priest who has passed through the heavens. He's gone into the Holy of Holies. He's gone to heaven to see the Father. Since then, we have this great high priest. Let us hold fast to our confession. See, not only did Jesus go there, but he carried the blood. See, the high priest would carry the blood of atonement from the sacrifice with him to give to God on the day of atonement. And Jesus, on the day of our atonement, on the day that he gave himself on the cross, passed through the heavens, carrying the blood of the Lamb, his own blood, to take to the Father, to give the final sacrifice for all the sins, ever past, ever in the future, that we might receive forgiveness. In the same way, we, friends, have a great high priest. 1 Timothy 2.5 says this, For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Jesus or Christ himself, Jesus Christ himself human. There is no need for any other mediator, friends, between God and man. Jesus, being human, is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows our grief. He died our death. He rose to give us new life because he, gave, he gained new life when he rose from the dead. 
in resurrection power. This is our high priest. I don't know about you, but my children sometimes argue with one another. Do any of you have or have children who argue? Nobody's raising their hands. Dinah, you and I are the only children. <laughs> If you have a single child, if you only added one child, that's fine. But if they argued with themselves, that is a different situation. But um, for those of you who have children that argued with one another, um, you know what it's like to become the mediator, don't you? You come into the situation, and there's one child that's crying, another one that's bleeding, and the other one's just playing quietly in the corner. And you're trying to figure out what happened. Where is the justice? Sometimes you feel a bit like Solomon must have felt when the two women came to him and said, this is both our child. And Solomon, in his wisdom, says, well, then cut the baby in half. One woman said, oh, it's fine, let it happen. The other one said, let her have the child because it was her child. She loved the baby so much she would rather see it go with the other woman than die just for her to be right. And, of course, Solomon knew that meant it was her child. Sometimes you feel like, you know what, let's just rip the toys in half doesn't matter whose toys they are. I'll figure it out. You know, my children need a mediator because they're not able to work it out between themselves. It's too difficult. Because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we need a mediator to go to God. We cannot approach God ourselves. At least that was the way it was before Christ. And so we needed someone to help us go to God. And God set up this system with worship, with the office of the high priest so that we might have a mediator to go into the Holy of Holies who would be cleansed, who would make a sacrifice so that we as God's people, we being the Israelites, the Hebrews, could be forgiven. We draw near, we draw near the, forgive me, I'm jumping ahead. So we need today a mediator. Because in our sin, we cannot approach God. We need someone to help us go to, go to God for us. And Jesus is the high priest who is our mediator. He is the final one. We need no others. This is not just general, though, friends. The, I imagine the high priest going in there, and there's thousands of people outside. He's, he's, he's asking and praying for the forgiveness of the sins of Israel. But he cannot sit there and name every single Israelite, can he? I don't care how sharp that man is. There's just no way. God's people were always too numerous for him to name them by name. But friends, even then, it was still personal. Even for them, it was still personal. Let me share you you how. In Exodus 28, 29, there are instructions that given by Moses to Aaron and to those priests who followed about how he was to be dressed. So Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment on his heart when he goes into the holy place for a continual remembrance before the Lord. So what would happen is all of the tribes of Israel were written on the breastplate so that when he went to the Holy of Holies, that those names would be before God. So as he's asking and praying for the forgiveness of God's people, those names would be bared out. Each tribe, each group would be forgiven. When Jesus goes into the heavens and goes before God to be our mediator, he bears with us Your name. He's speaking on behalf of Dean and John and Pat and Karen and Brad and Nancy. He's bearing your names before the Father. He's speaking on your behalf. He's speaking to the Father through the Spirit. And he is in the beauty of the Trinity Become our mediator, our high priest we need, that we might be forgiven because of the blood he carries. Isn't that beautiful? It's personal. Verse 16 says this. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with what? Boldness. Friends, it's hard to whisper boldness. I'm just going to tell you that. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with Boldness, yes, so that we might receive mercy and find grace in, to help in time of need. We have confidence, friends, not in how good we are. I'll tell you what, if I need mercy, it's because I've done something wrong. That's why my wife has gotten very good at giving me mercy. Because I often 
figure out how to fit the size 13 in my mouth, okay? And that's just the, back, that's just the practice, though, of being human. We, we are failures every day. But that is not why we get to approach the throne of grace with boldness. It's not because of how good you are. But like I said earlier, it's because of what he has done on your behalf. It's because he is the mediator, the high priest we need. We approach the throne of grace with confidence, with boldness, forgive me, so that we might receive mercy. The Holy of Holies was a place that the high priest would be cleansed ritually. He'd, he'd physically be, be washed And then he would be forgiven and pray. And then finally, after a long ritual cleansing, he would go into the Holy of Holies. But he would tie a rope, according to the law, a rope around his ankle and a bell. And if the priest outside of the Holy of Holies heard the bell in a, I'm guessing a bit of a thud (laughs) after that, they would pull his body out by the rope. Because going into the presence of God with any sin in your life meant that you would be struck dead by the power of God. Think about it. Who is the sinless one who doesn't need cleansing? Who is the one who goes to the Father to say your name as the mediator? Friends, we approach the throne of grace with boldness, not because of how good we are, but because of what Jesus has done for us. (laughs) We draw near confidence in Christ and we receive mercy. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. Okay, that's mercy. Mercy. Grace is getting what we do not deserve. And it's the throne of grace to receive mercy. Especially in our, and find grace to help in time of need. And don't we have time of need every day? Don't we need help right now? Isn't that beautiful? If we come to God and tell God to give us mercy, ask God, request God, we are admitting then that we deserve mercy. The worst. Why would we do this? It's because we are convinced of our sin and our need for grace. Hebrews 12, 4, 12, and 13. This is the, the previous verses, okay? Hear this. The beginning of our verses. Indeed, the word of God is living and... Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, bone and... Last half the verse. There we go. Joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Friends, we approach the throne of grace naked, in a sense. We approach the throne of grace with nothing to hide, with nothing hidden, with nothing kept in the darkness, because this is what God's word does. God knows all that is before us. This is part of God's omniscience. That is, he knows everything. Do you remember when you were a kid growing up and you were asked to clean your room? And so you, I'm sorry, you were asked to clean your room and so you cleaned your room. Do you know what I'm talking about? That was the moment which you tried to make sure that every single space that wasn't really seen as much was filled to the brim with all the stuff you didn't want to be seen. So that meant that you took all of the Nerf guns and the clothes that you hadn't put away, and all the other papers from school in your backpack that you hadn't used for a month because it was summertime, and you shoved them into the closet, and you shut the doors. Clean as, clean as a whistle, right? Anybody else do that? Does anybody still do that as an adult? Yeah. I'd never, never, anyway, okay. Um, before I need to approach the throne of grace again, I'm just gonna keep going. Um, We often try to hide things, friends. In the same way God, like your parents, comes in and he checks the closets. And he brings all that stuff you've hidden out. He reveals all the sin, the shame, the hurt, and the embarrassment we've ever held back. And he brings it out. But then he tells us to approach him in his throne. His throne's not one of power and might. It's it's not a game of thrones. (laughs) <laughs> with all the swords, if you remember that TV show. But it is approach the throne of grace with boldness to receive mercy and grace in our time of need. We are hardwired from creation to respond to our sin and shame in a certain way. Look at Genesis 3, 7 through 8. We're almost done here, friends. 
Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. And they heard the sound of God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. That sounds so beautiful. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So much there. But when Adam and Eve sinned, here's what they did. Immediately they felt shame because they realized they were naked. Secondly, they immediately covered themselves up. Sewed the fig leaves and the loincloths. Make it less obvious. Shove the stuff in the closet, the dirt under the rug. Keep the secret. Don't talk about it. Don't let anybody else know about it. We're very good about these things. We're very good about these things. There are secrets that are hidden for generations and that come forth and bring shame to a family, friends. We're very good as humanity at figuring out new ways to hide the same old shame. And then they hid from God. You know, it's easy to hide from God if you try to. Because God invites us to himself, but here's the thing. We find easy ways to hide from God. Friends, it's not just hiding from God like they did, but you know, it's easy to say, man, I just, I need some more rest. I'm not going to be in worship this week. You know, I'm just so busy these days. I'll just go every other week. I'll just go once a month. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you're the ones who are here, but I'm telling you right now, sometimes people stop coming to church because they don't want to meet, confront the reality of what's going on in their heart. I'm not saying that's the reason everyone isn't here. I'm not standing in judgment of them. That's not my place. But I'm telling you that we all have done this at one time or another if we're going to be honest with ourselves. It's hard to be up front with God. But it's what we need to do, friends, if we want to receive mercy and grace. God already knows our shame. He sees your heart. He knows your sin. What are we to do? Hebrews 4, 16. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So I'll sum it up this. God knows your shame and sin and he knows everything about you. He knows everything you've ever done. He knows all the secrets that have been hidden down far back. He knows the stuff you haven't thought about for years and the stuff that you think about every day. He knows exactly how much potential you have and don't have. He knows all the things you've failed to do. He knows all the times you have failed to follow him. And here's the reality of it all. He loves you. He loves you so much that he is the high priest you need. And so he gave the sacrifice. And then he passed through the heavens to take the blood of his atonement to the Father to pay once and all for the sin of all the world humanity, past, present, and future, so that we might receive mercy and grace from the throne of grace. Because the time we need help is today and every day. Friends, we have called then to respond to this grace, this offer. We are called to confess our sins. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does anyone else want to be cleansed, forgiven, and free today? I do. We do not approach the in our own confidence, in our own flesh, we approach in confidence in Jesus who gave his life for us. That cleansing and forgiveness is, not, is what God does for us and through us. Jesus is the great high priest we need. Not, even, not maybe the one we expect, maybe not the one we think we need. He is the one we need. Not the one we want, necessarily. But friends, he is the one we need because he is the one who fulfills every promise from God. Let us then approach the throne of grace and confidence with boldness today, friends. Confess your sins. Stop covering it up. And when you are in need, his grace is sufficient and available. This is the high priest we need, and Jesus is his name. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our high priest. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you 
for going to the Father on our behalf to call us by name, Lord. To imagine that in the throne room of heaven, that my name has been mentioned to the Father on, by your lips, Lord. I shudder to think that I would ever understand the depth of your love. But Lord, that I might know it. So Lord, today we come before you to approach your throne. That as we worship, we might leave behind our shame and our sin. That we might leave behind the burdens that we bear. That we might be free. Because in Jesus, we are free. For freedom, you have set us free. To then worship you in obedience as you call us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Friends, as the church in confession, would you stand and say what we believe in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, he seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One thing we've learned from church history is that when we do business with God, God shows up. When we reveal ourselves in confession, when we approach the throne of grace with confidence, friends, God shows up. So here's the thing. I'll give you this invitation. Respond as you desire. But the, the altar's open as we close. The altar's always open. My, my office is open. If you need to confess, if you need prayer, friends, come and ask someone for that. It doesn't need to be me. It can be any other Christian here. But let us together approach the throne of grace and be a worshiping community of confession and of one free. Let's worship as we close in prayer, close in song. Our closing hymn is number 367, He Touched Me. He touched me, the vapored in, neath the load of guilt and shame. Then the hand of Jesus touched me, and now I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and all oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made I met this blessed Savior Since he cleansed and made me whole I will never cease to praise him How shall it while eternity rolls He touched me, oh he touched me Floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know He touched me and made me whole. Amen. Friends, as the church, I I'd like to, one other thing I'd like to say, tonight at 6.30, join us for family night. If you'd like to help us get set up and get ready, we can use some more hands. We're going to be here uh, by 5.30 to set up some tables, to get games set up, uh, get some food set out, get some hot dogs grilled. So if you'd like to join us, friends, please um, join us around that time. Otherwise, as the people of God, go with boldness into the world, not in the confidence in your flesh, but in the confidence in Christ, to share good news that others might know the joy of his love. Amen. Amen.